Am I am I alive? <laughs> it's not. Is am I alive? Yeah. Why well, I, I started it? There's a problem again. <laughs> I'm live. Am I alive? Okay. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone see me? <laughs> okay. Um, hi, welcome to Eat Predators Alive. I'm Alexa Nicholas, and I guess let's digest the last 48 hours of my birth window. <laughs> I feel like my child is going to have such the, the, the craziest uh, birth story of all time, honestly. It's just, uh, it's a little bit awkward, it's a little bit weird, and it's a little bit stressful, but um, I'm managing. <laughs> so in the last 48 hours, I guess Brandon Quinn and his lawyers sent me and my husband a cease to exist <laughs> is really what I call it. I feel like these like cease and desist are really just ways to get the other person to like not exist. So I received one from Venable LLP from someone named Sarah E. Diamond. Let's pull up the season to this. I'm new to this, so I'm going to be super slow. So I hope you guys can uh, have some patience with me as I manage this whole thing. So here's Venable LLP, Sarah E. Diamond, confidential legal notice, not so confidential anymore. Publication or dissemination is prohibited. Well, whoops. Notice to cease and desist. Dear Miss Nicholas, Venable LLP is litigation counsel for Brandon Quinn. The Brandon Quinn, they forgot. We understand that you have been maliciously spreading grossly defamatory and false information that is damaging to Mr. Quinn's personal and professional character. Your conduct is per se defamatory in the state of California, which makes it unlawful for an individual to publish a false statement that harms a person's professional reputation. By this letter, we hereby demand that you, E Predators Inc., cute, and any affiliated entities or companies collectively referred to herein as you immediately take down all false and unfounded accusations pertaining to Mr. Quinn, including his name, image, persona, or likeness from all social media platforms, including Instagram and Twitter X. He's trying to erase me. And immediately cease to exist, no, it's a season and two season to cease from publishing further false statements about Mr. Quinn. If you fail to immediately comply, ooh, spooky, Venable will file a lawsuit seeking compensa com compensatory, <laughs> can't even talk lawyer talk, damages, punitive damages, disgorgement of revenues. Oy. It's a property, 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 patriarchy, 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 an injunction and an award of attorney's fees. They're like, and we get paid just to let you know, like, <laughs> we're going to make sure we get paid. If he doesn't pay us, we're going to make sure you pay us. It's like, OK, cool. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about seize and desist, uh, especially when it comes to ones from public figures towards survivors. Most of the time, these cease and desist really act as ways of silencing, you know, the survivor. It is usually, in my opinion, a fear tactic within an extreme unfair power dynamic. Usually what happens here, some girl or boy will end up getting a cease and desist freaking out, thinking that they now have to get a lawyer, which, by the way, lawyers aren't cheap. It's easy to get a pro bono lawyer as a plaintiff, but as a defendant, it's you can't really get a pro bono lawyer as a defendant. So you have to pay out of pocket. You have to retain a lawyer. And most of these lawyers are like $600 an hour. So even for a survivor to respond to that cease and desist, they would have to spend like a thousand bucks just for one email. So it's scary. It's terrifying. And it also um, puts you in a financial situation that is 
devastating for most survivors. Most survivors are not in the power dynamic position that these alleged predators usually are. There's usually some type of unfair power dynamic happening. And so, and they take advantage of that with, you know, allegedly something like uh, Venable LLP. So anyways, they go on to tell me what things I have to take down. What's interesting about this all is, though, is that I said alleged the entire time. I said allegedly. I said in my opinion because it was in my opinion. And I also said multiple times that I don't know if these messages are real. But if they are real, then this is how I feel about them. And that's my First Amendment right. So if you don't like America, then get out <laughs> because that's what America is all about. I'm allowed to my opinion. I'm allowed to my opinion as a survivor with experience of these power dynamics. I'm speaking from experience. I'm not speaking as a lawyer from Venable. I'm speaking as Alexa Nicholas, who's a fucking survivor. So I know how these power dynamics go. And if the lawyer is probably watching right now, listen up. So I know how what I'm talking about. This is my opinion. I never said I knew for sure if these conversations were real, but they were really, really scary. Um, if they are real, that's really the point of this. And then they try to like say that they have to like prove, obviously, if I was doing this maliciously. No, bro, I'm not doing this maliciously. If these messages are real, I'm trying to protect our community. It doesn't come from a malicious intention. It actually comes from a divine intention. It comes from a very, very good intention. It comes from a resolute protector intention. I'm protecting children if this is real. So the malicious thing is crap. So whatever. Or scur scurrilous. <laughs> Sorry, let's move on because I really want to read the words that they put in here that are just absolutely ridiculous and meant to make you feel like, what does this mean? And then you like define it and you're like oh okay <laughs> this isn't even this isn't even that serious um first and foremost you have plainly and maliciously now remember they have to say malicious as many times as possible because they have to prove that it was a malicious intent for it to be defamation right so we all know that i didn't talk about this maliciously i was asking questions i wanted to know if this was real and i wanted to make sure that young girls out there were protected so maliciously disregarded the facts. I didn't disregard any facts. As you have been told repeatedly, you're repeatedly, <laughs> isn't this just one email? Your false allegations against Mr. Quinn concerning inappropriate messaging on Instagram with a 15 year old girl in 2017 are completely fabricated. Fabricated is a very uh, overused word from lawyers. Mr. Quinn completely and categorically denies these false and defamatory allegations and prove it. Prove it. Don't bother yourself with me. Unsurprisingly, you have not presented any actual proof, and neither has he. To substantiate your scurrilous, <laughs> I'm thinking of like a squirrel, like I can't, a scur at your scurrilous accusation, you do not because you cannot. First of all, this looks like a cease and desist template that you just started chucking, like whatever, putting things in um, to make it look like it was actually took hours to make. But this looks like a template from Venable where you just started plugging in, you know, the links and his name and... <laughs> It's just a template, basically. Um, but yeah, they're saying I can't. It, well, the reason why I couldn't, by the way, if Venable wants to know why I wasn't able to put all of the alleged um, evidence onto YouTube was because I said if I posted even one sentence of these alleged conversations, I would be kicked off of YouTube. Literally. Like they were that allegedly horrendous you know so to say that I couldn't is not true I can put it maybe on another format which I started to do I started to share it on Twitter but to say that is absolutely ridiculous because I'm on YouTube bro like you got to know the guidelines on YouTube your uh your client doesn't fit on the guidelines on YouTube um second your conduct is a clear violation of the law you know, that sentence is kind of scary when you read it because you're like, whoa, did I violate the law? But what's so interesting about this is 
again, if these conversations are real with Brandon Quinn, I think those would be allegedly a clear violation of the law. I mean, I don't know. Am I am I wrong? <laughs> Anyways, statements are defamatory per se, eliminating the need to prove special damages, yada, yada, yada. So you can tell now it's going into examples of past lawsuits, examples of how the law works. Can they hear me? Am I fine? What's going on? Oh, sorry. Is it not up? (laughs) I'm sorry, guys. I didn't realize that I didn't have the season to assist up. Um, So basically they go through, you know, All the things of why I have to take down X, Y, and Z. Um, And then they go into my favorite new word, scintilla. Scintilla. I didn't know what it meant. But now I know what... um, I think I know what scintilla looks like. Let's get out of here for, for a second. This is scintilla deville. This is um, a.k.a. Sarah E. Diamond. This is allegedly (laughs) Brandon uh, Quinn's lawyer. Now, usually these law firms will put a woman um, in charge of these situations because they think it looks better um, to have a woman defending alleged predators or alleged abusers. Um, So here uh, is uh, Cindilla... (laughs) Scintilla DeVille. Um, Let's read a little bit about her. Why not? Scintilla DeVille is a trial lawyer and civil litigator with broad experience in the entertainment industry. Sarah has represented studios, talent, and Fortune 500 companies in all stages of litigation in state and federal courts, including at trial. She has extensive experience advising high-profile clients on best practices pertaining to contract disputes, intellectual property, we got that, uh, IP, employment, and privacy issues to minimize litigation risk. All these lawyers anyways are always trying to minimize the litigation risk. Like, in my opinion, when I see these cease and desist sent by lawyers, it's, it's really a protection strategy so that they're trying to either silence the victim quickly without having to get into the litigation process um, or you know they're trying to you know find a way later on to settle before it really gets to trial for example so it, they're just like cleaner uppers kind of Sarah has defended companies and directors and officers in a broad range of complex commercial litigation, including breach of contract cases, privacy class actions. Okay, we get it. Prior to law school, Sarah was the director of programming of a major American film festival. What's the American Film Festival? Why didn't you put... Wait, is that what it's called? Like, is it actually just called American Film Festival or is it a major... Like, why wouldn't she say, put it on your resume? I want to see the resume. What what film festival? I'm actually, she's a film lover. Okay. Um, I'm surprised why she wouldn't just put uh, the name. So anyways, here's Sinvilla DeVille representing Brandon Quinn. Um, and honestly, I was a little shooken up when I found out that my husband received a cease and desist because I am in my birth window and, you know, it's scary. It's scary even for someone like me who's kind of been through the ringer of this for a little while and experienced, you know, a lot of lawyers, a lot of um, cease and desists, Um, just a lot of threats from lawyers, um, especially when I was going through my litigation with my abuser, Michael Milos, uh, of Rye, you know, it's, it's very triggering. Lawyers really trigger the hell out of survivors. And that's really kind of the whole point is to make the survivor feel as though they're not, it's a gaslighting. Like really they're just professional gaslighters they have a license in gaslighting and they will literally make you think that whatever you are doing is not right it's your fault and you're gonna have to pay for it and it's very very triggering so I almost wanted to 
like step away obviously for half a second you know because this is tough and this is not easy and it does take a toll on those around me and I have to always be aware of that fact when I'm doing this type of advocacy work um but then I just got <laughs> then I was just reminded of those girls those alleged girls and when I when I got reminded of those alleged girls I came out of the shower and I was like you know what no um I'm not gonna back down from this um in the sense where I still want to know um if these messages are real uh, I do would like to hear it from Brandon Quinn himself. And again, not through these paid for lawyers. Um, I just want to be nine weeks pregnant and due to give birth at any moment. Under these circumstances, I'm sure you can understand that I am unable to properly dige digest, let alone address. Oh, I glitched from the top. Okay. Um, so here's my response to uh, Sinvilla DeVille. Um, I have received the cease and desist letter that you sent to my old email and my husband. While I wish to provide a proper response, I am 39 weeks pregnant and due to give birth at any moment. Under these circumstances, I am sure you can understand that I am unable to properly digest, let alone address, the issues raised in your letter. Once I have given birth to my child and had a moment to recover, I will follow up with you. Right? <laughs> Thank you in advance for your consideration. Sincerely, Alexa Nicholas. So I sent that yesterday at 6.40 p.m. It's 3.47 the next day. I have not heard back from her. So I don't know if that means she is going to let me give birth to my child in peace as a survivor or if she, I don't know what she's up to, um, but I'm hoping that she does the right thing here and allows me to at least give birth in peace before we discuss this and also gives me time to retain counsel if necessary um, because let, let's just be honest, like I, I was on a show called Zoe 101 and to a lot of people I'm a well-known person, I guess, but I'm not rolling in any type of dough. Like I don't do this for money actually I lost my career even doing this advocacy work like for example um I want to call them UTI but <laughs> what are they called again Mika I'm talking to you Mika I guess I'm delayed because my husband doesn't even realize that I'm talking to him right now UTA sorry not UTI um UTI <laughs> UTA um basically was going to you know sign me uh, around the time that I protested against Nickelodeon. Um, and then around the week, I was supposed to meet up with them for like an actual meeting. It seemed like it was actually going to happen. And then uh, the Brian Friedman article came out in Business Insider. Let me take this response out for a second because it's actually very important to know what happens when you start to speak up against these alleged predators in the industry. So I was going to meet up with her for th around Thanksgiving time. And I was actually really excited because I wanted to maybe be represented for a podcast. And, you know, a lot of people that do advocacy work, we're kind of told that we're not supposed to um, be rewarded financially for all of our good work, like well-intentioned work. Um, and then the bad guys are supposed to, it's like bad guys make money, good guys have to, you know, be poor basically. And so I was excited that someone actually maybe wanted to represent um, the advocacy work I was doing with e-predators through a podcast or something like that. And so it seemed like everything was going really, really well. And then Brian Friedman's article came out in Business Insider. I can't even pull up. Um, the article because once again the actual headline of this article about Brian Friedman would also ban me from YouTube but let's just say he has an alleged very dark past with a minor um, at Berkeley while he was getting ready to go to law school and so anyways I protested in front of his office two times um, hoping that maybe more people would understand um, how 
how unfair the litigation system is because for example with Brian Friedman he was my abuser's lawyer and I wasn't able to after finding out about his past I wasn't able to tell my lawyers hey I actually would like to be deposed by an other lawyer in the law firm because being deposed by him is extremely triggering as a survivor since he is an alleged predator himself. And I don't feel like that's fair. And when I realized survivors didn't have the right to choose that, um, it really terrified me and it made me want to advocate not only for myself, but also for all survivors out there that have to experience someone like Brian Friedman. So anyways, it took about a year to even get this article to come out about his public court documents that you can find at the Alameda Courthouse. Came out and then UTI. (laughs) UTI disappeared. And I basically got ghosted from UTI. Um, UTA. And I messaged her and then eventually she messaged me back pretending that she was sick, I think. Um, it just didn't feel honest for some reason. I sent her the Brian Freeman article basically being like, Hey, did you read this? Because it's starting to feel, you know, it just started to feel like it was too weird. We were totally fine up until that point. And, um, that was the last time I heard from UTA. And then one night my husband and I are watching a Clippers game because my husband is a Clippers fan. And sure enough, Guess who's courtside um, with Brian Friedman, the owner of UTA, okay? So my suspicions start to feel true. (laughs) Um, And so I'm not represented, obviously, by UTA now, but this is just to show you how unfair the power dynamic is even when you come forward um, as a survivor and then you try to actually advocate for other survivors. You, you really don't stand a chance. They really stack up every single thing against you, like their lawyers, uh, for example. So that was scary. I didn't know what to do. Started talking to lawyers, obviously. You realize how expensive it is to get a lawyer to even respond to a cease and desist. And, you know, I just thought, why not start a GoFundMe? Not only to help myself through this very difficult time, um, but to also show survivors that they don't have to back down, that there is a a community that cares about them and that is willing to support them. I I also wanted that GoFundMe to show survivors um, that people do care and that you don't have to be silenced. You don't have to be afraid anymore because that is what they thrive off of is that fear because that fear ends up turning into silence and then these alleged predators allegedly get away with their alleged crimes, etc. So I didn't know if anyone was going to donate, but I was like, even if like five people end up donating to this GoFundMe, That's going to show me and so many other survivors that people do care and that we can also take the power back into our own hands, that we're not helpless in these situations. And we actually have a community that cares. Um, And so, yeah, so that's that's what ended up. Oh, yeah, I got to pull it up. Sorry, I'm not used to this um, yet. Where is the. Oh, there it is. Okay, Where am I? Let's pull up the GoFundMe. So here it is. Brandon Quinn is threatening to sue Alexa Nicholas. Let's see where we're at. Um, I'm going to refresh it just to see. Wow, $2,355. That's amazing. Um, Especially since I have a a lot of friends that are survivors that get put into arbitration situations where... No one even knows, you know, the judgments that some of these alleged predators put onto their alleged victims. Um, It's really terrifying. Like survivors end up getting in sometimes two million dollars in debt just because of sneaky lawyer things that sneaky, creepy lawyers do with one another. And it, it, you know, 
I won't, uh, I want to say fuck, but like it fucks up a survivor's life. These people, the, some of these lawyers literally ruin survivors' lives, literally ruin them ruin them deplete them they have to like file for bankruptcy no one even knows what's happening to them because they're in these arbitration situations where the public can't even know what's going on um so yeah so to see this this type of support and not a judgment for example to see these digits as going towards a survivor not on top of like not burying a survivor is um just a wonderful thing um to see here and and also I did give the option for people to go to the e-predator shop and you know buy some of the e-predators um here we'll just click on it um some of the, the merchandise there because that will be also a way for me to use those funds um to retain counsel but like let's imagine now what Brandon Quinn's alleged victims feel like Right. So I'm here. I have a little bit of a platform. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I have a past kids show that people uh, liked. And so therefore they uh, listen to me or follow me on Instagram. Let's think about let's take a moment to think about these alleged victims um, or one of them. And for her you know, that this scared her, which is the scariest part about his cease and desist. It's scary for me, but the first thing I thought about was how scary it is for her because she definitely doesn't, she's not in the same situation as me. She's a lot younger. And now she knows that Brandon Quinn, the Brandon Quinn will do this possibly if she were to come forward herself because remember and I said it at the end of my video she came to me and I hope this lawyer is listening because she came to me scared to come forward and you know what you validated that fear you validated that fear for that girl that alleged girl you validated that fear and you know even a shame on you right now because if he did do it again if those messages are real that poor young girl is even more afraid to come forward with her story and it sends chills down my spine that this is still continuing to happen because the law should not be used for silencing crimes and it shouldn't be used for silencing victims of crimes. It's supposed to be for justice and truth. Justice and truth. You went to law school. You should know that. This isn't justice anymore at this point. Honestly, as a survivor, when I had to go through the litigation process with my abuser, you know what it taught me? I don't stand a chance in the justice system. The justice system is hell for a survivor. And everyone goes, oh, you know, she's going into litigation for the money. There's nothing to be made there. It's hell. It's only re-victimization. You're in therapy more. You're crying more. You're, you're, you're reliving past traumas. It's awful. It's awful and it's all about property and money and it's not about your feelings or your life whatsoever. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And certain lawyers actually side against evil. It's really like evil. That's what I really faced when I was in litigation. It was like, wow, there are people that defend evil. <laughs> like you know, you don't think that's real, you know? And then you go into a litigation process and you're like, Wow, I've never been more bullied in my entire life than by a lawyer, by a freaking lawyer. Even the public trolls of Twitter don't even amount. That's why when I see those tweets from these bot bros, doesn't even phase me anymore. Because when you come across these lawyers that go up against survivors, they are ruthless. 
They make you feel like it was your fault and that you're a liar. You, you're actually told every day, basically, that your trauma is a lie. That's what litigation felt like for me, you know? And so, sorry, I went into a tan, you know, I got triggered there for a moment. But it's really important to, to understand that litigation abuse is a very, very real thing. And people allegedly that don't want to actually face any type of accountability sometimes do abuse our justice system um, to save their careers, to save their family, to say whatever it is, it's this process of cleaning up and saving their property. And it's very much based on patriarchal um, Western concepts where it's like, let's protect the property. It's all about the finances and it's all about the property. And it's not about the individual. It's not about the soul of a human being. It's not about the life of a human being. It's about the property around the person being accused of something. And it's heartbreaking and it's really, really painful. And I honestly wouldn't even want to recommend it to anybody litigation. It was, I don't even want to go back there because of how triggering it was. And then if you drop a lawsuit, for example, you get told, oh, it wasn't real to begin with. And it's like, no, a lot of survivors will have to drop their lawsuit because they can't do it anymore. They can't do it anymore. They lose their life. During my lawsuit, I had a one-year-old child. I had to go downstairs for like four hours a day. You have to relive your trauma. And then upstairs, you hear your kid having a nice time. And you want to go spend time with your kid. You don't want to be downstairs reliving your trauma and having to hear what the other side is doing to you. Like, for example, Brian Freeman wanted me to preserve nudes of me when I was an underage girl for example, and you're just getting triggered when you should be enjoying the time with your family. People don't realize what survivors go through. Even when they're trying to get justice, they're basically just reliving their trauma. So having sympathy for them is so important because it's really, really fucking hard um, being a survivor. Nothing you do ever is right pretty much. You don't come forward, it's not true. You come forward, it's not true. You you sue your abuser, it's not true. It just nothing you do is good enough. So, what happened today, that flex onto me, which I'm going to call it a flex, an alleged flex. I'm sure he loves flexing in the mirror. Um <laughs> that alleged flex um scared possibly other girls, other alleged girls from coming forward. And it's just awful. It's just honestly awful. So that GoFundMe is not only to go towards retaining a lawyer, okay? We're, we're putting money into that GoFundMe to show survivors everywhere that we stand with them and that we are willing to support them when they're in a situation that's unfair, a power dynamic that is unfair. That's what that GoFundMe to me represents more than it is about retaining counsel. It's about showing survivors we care. Um, so again, if you want to <laughs> send more money to the GoFundMe page, that would be awesome because I really want to frame the end of it. I hope we surpass 10,000. I can give it all back that we don't even have to retain counsel just to show survivors how many people came together for them because most of the time they're super left alone. And they end up, another thing, they end up with pro bono lawyers. And let me tell you something about pro bono lawyers. They get a good rep because they're pro bono. You know what pro bono means? Is that they can drop you at any second. What pro bono means is that you, can, you feel bad about even calling them because you're not paying them. Now there's an unhealthy also power dynamic with your lawyer because your lawyer constantly is reminding you they're pro bono. You're not paying them. And then you have the defense or the alleged abuser and they're able to just throw down money and basically tell their lawyer to do whatever the hell it is they want them to do. They're like basically working you know, they're working for that person. But a survivor doesn't get that. 
A survivor feels bad about every email. I see survivors get emails from their pro bono lawyers that are so abusive and disgusting. I hope one day they come out because they'll literally make the survivor feel as though that they shouldn't be reaching out to them about their own case. And they'll remind them, oh, we put $500 here. We put $600 here. And it's like, okay, but you're a pro bono lawyer and you're going up against a powerful person. And the reason that you are doing it pro bono is because you're hoping for either a settlement. Because let me tell you something. They all say survivors want the settlement. No, 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 no. That's not who wants the settlement. It's that pro bono lawyer that's representing that survivor. That's the person who's like trying to figure out a way to get their money back, to get that settlement. The survivor just wants justice. And yeah, it would be really nice to have, you know, some type of reparation for your trauma. I don't think a survivor should have any shame because you know how expensive therapy is? I didn't get to have therapy that entire time because I didn't have enough money for health insurance during litigation. So I had to go through all of that without any mental health care. And a lot of survivors do. So some of that settlement money, like when I, if, if that ever were to happen for a survivor, would go towards mental health care, hopefully a vacation for them. They deserve those things. The abuser doesn't deserve those things. The victim, the survivor deserves those things, but yet they get, they get shamed for even wanting that. But then the abuser can keep getting Coachella shows, for example, making tons of money, and no one really shames that person into it. But the survivor who might just want a therapist regularly or a vacation after their abuse gets shamed. You know, and so there's this whole industry around the survivors and the abusers. And instead, the distraction goes to the abuser and the survivor. But there's media outlets that make money off of the clickbait of the abuse. There are the lawyers making tons of money off of the settlements and the trial pay and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then you just you, there's su such a big industry actually around it. But yet the survivor gets blamed for what? Wanting some type of exhale in their life, you know? So I know I went on that tangent, um, but that's what that GoFundMe represents to me personally is showing survivors that they can ask for help from their community and that they actually can receive that help and that support. And it's time for the power dynamic to shift a little bit. You know, I'm not saying it has to flop over, but it's got to shift just a little bit. And survivors have to start feeling empowered. And we need a community to do that. We do need other people. We need allies to, to stand up for us. We do, we do need that. Um, and, and it's okay for us to ask for that help, I think. Um, I think it's time for survivors to not feel any fear around, um, asking for help, uh, during these very, very unfair times. I wanted to pull up an article that I was looking at actually right before I came on to here. Um, let's see where it is. Oh, here it is. Okay, perfect. So defamation lawsuits, another tactic to silence survivors. Too often perpetrators of SV use the courts to punish survivors for speaking out about abuse, further victimizing those who choose to come forward. Okay. Where are we? Okay. So the decision to speak publicly about one's own experience of SV or harassment is personal and often complicated. Due to a culture of stigma, okay, first of all, the stigma around even coming forward and the shame fueled by deficient laws and a criminal justice system that rarely takes victims of SA seriously. Survivors are often reluctant to come forward with their experience. I wonder why. I wonder why, because look how quick the scare tactics come up. Additionally, if and when survivors speak out, they are frequently silenced by the same person who threatens their safety or the safety of their loved ones. Now, for example, this is my opinion. They also threaten my husband, 
with a lawsuit, Brandon Quinn. You see this? It's not, they go after everything around the, the survivor. They don't even go after directly the survivor. They'll try to isolate the survivor. They'll hope that maybe the stress in the home, for example, will make that survivor back down. I know what they're doing. Been there, done that. In short, society has never made it easy for women and girls, survivors, to safely report or share their experiences of SV. If they choose to do so, the International Women's Rights Organization I work for, Equality Now, has noticed a worrying trend that has further raised the stakes for survivors who choose to speak out. The weaponization of defamation lawsuits. Lawsuits and litigation as means to silence and retaliate against the survivors. Now, that's a really important thing to also talk about. It's not just to silence them. It's like revenge. And then they tell like survivors that they're like on some type of like revenge path. That's called projection, bro. <laughs> the, usually it's the abuser who is trying to get back at the survivor for speaking up against them. You know, so just really important to note that it's also a retaliation. It's violent. Equality now has witnessed the global rise in defamation lawsuits. Interesting. So the more I see that survivors are coming forward, then we see defamation lawsuits go up and up. Used to retaliate against and silence women who speak out denouncing gender-based violence. That's right. It's gender-based violence. Including victims and survivors who speak out about their own abuse. Examples of this can be seen all around the world, including United States, India, Georgia, the Netherlands, it goes on and on. We have followed these cases, and in each instance, the person accused of SV attempts to use the courts to punish the survivor for having spoken out about the abuse she allegedly experienced. Even in some cases, after an official confirmation of the abuse has been made, it is a tactic meant to intimidate, discredit, and silence victims and future victims of SV. It is also a violation of international human rights law. That's right, lawyer boys, <laughs> law firms, you hear that? It is also a violation of international human rights law. Sin Villa. Survivors have the right to speak out about their experiences. That's right. And we also have the right to our freaking opinion about it, too. When SV survivors speak out, their right to speech is protected by law and must continue to be protected in practice. Survivors have a right to share their stories even when their public expressions offend, shock, disturb, or disclose aspects of someone's private life, a ruling that has been held by international human rights courts. And their experiences are a matter of public interest that can help fundamentally change the social discourse around SV. Upholding survivors' right to freedom of expression is fundamental to protecting the rights of women especially the right to live free from violence and is essential for the prevention of SV. Not just for women also, by the way, every survivor out there, no matter what their gender is. Defamation lawsuits that aim to silence survivors or retaliate against them are a form of GBV. What is GBV? A predominant characteristic of gender-based violence is the unequal power differential that exists between the offender and the survivor, and it is the same, very same power differential that is exploited in lawsuits that attempt to silence or discredit the survivor. In a report on line violence against women and girls, the UN... Basically, it goes on to state like the act of threatening survivors with legal proceedings in an attempt to prevent them from reporting their situation is a form of GBV itself. So, OK, you know, Brandon Quinn can say whatever he wants about what he felt about sending me that cease and desist. Um, but I also have my own opinion about what I feel about that cease and desist and what it could possibly do. Um, to survivors everywhere. 
And it's not even just the alleged survivor of Brandon Quinn, for example. It's survivors everywhere. The more that these powerful men, powerful alleged predators, get to use these extreme fear tactics within really unfair power dynamics, we are going to see this type of, I can't, I don't know what I can say on YouTube, but this type of suffering continue. It's just going to continue because they keep silencing us. And what is silence? It's violence. And I really don't want my daughter to grow up in a world where she feels that if she comes forward about something that happened to her, and she comes forward because she wants to make sure it doesn't happen to any others, that she will be punished and not the person who did it to her. I don't want to see that world continue to crystallize. I want to see it change. And so I think I went a lot longer than I thought I was going to um, be on this live. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of where I'm at right now <laughs> as a survivor. I'm not currently in my own um, personal lawsuit against my um, abuser um, because I don't want to be. I learned, like I said, really, really, really re-traumatizing. And what I chose to do instead that became very healing for me was this. And it was for standing up for other survivors. And that's where I've seen a lot more justice, sadly. I've seen a lot more justice doing this work than I did in the justice system, for example. So I want to say thank you again to everybody for supporting this channel um, because supporting this channel is not supporting me and it's not even supporting the channel. We are supporting survivors everywhere by supporting this channel. Um, and that's why I'm doing this. Um, it's not malicious. <laughs> it's actually to protect others and to stand up against the bad guys, which aren't those the people, the superheroes? Are superheroes now malicious? <laughs> I thought superheroes were like the ones we look up to, people going up against the bad guys, right? Those are the good guys. Those aren't the malicious ones. The malicious ones are the bad guys. Um, and I'm not a bad guy. Um, I'm not. But I do know a few bad guys. <laughs> Actually, I know a few alleged bad guys. I know a few alleged bad law firms too. Um, so yeah, I guess that's uh, where I'm at with Brandon Quinn. I guess we will wait to see if um, Miss Sarah Diamond will be sending me an email sometime soon, allowing me either to give birth in peace or to not. And we'll be seeing if Brandon Quinn will be allowing me to give birth in peace or not. Um, so we're waiting. Um, and we're still strong, surprisingly. Even this pregnant, I'm, I'm still feeling strong because of the support. And so that's how important community, that's how important community is. Never underestimate community. I feel like I got a lot off of my chest. <laughs> um, thank you for joining my first live. And hopefully um, you took away something from it or you felt more supported or you felt more of an ally after this or whatever it may be. I hope it was at least a positive experience at the end of it. And um, thank you so much. For supporting this channel and please don't forget to subscribe um again so we show survivors are supported and like the video um and i'll see you next time actually next week wednesday is an, another episode of e predators daily where we go into rolling stone and brian friedman and marlo the dog and mr me too guy and yeah it's gonna be an interesting episode please please tune in it's important okay Ah. <sighs>